Okay, we'll go with that. I'm going to start out by apologizing. Um, I'm getting over a bit of a cold, so probably many times through this presentation I'm going to have to stop and cough a bit. Um, and I apologize for people sitting next to me through this as well. Um, but so some people sort of touched on different aspects and have asked, you know, what do you engage with? How do you engage? And so my presentation is going to sort of um, bring out some information I found, some ideas that I'm sort of developing. So a real, real quick condensed version of digital engagement. Um, you get the early websites uh, in the 1990s. Now, supposedly, there's about half a billion active websites. And that's uh, within, they've been updated in the last year or so. Um, I should also say, it's incredibly hard to find accurate data about the internet that's actually up to date. So um, uh, some of these numbers, it's what I found. I'm, a bit skeptical, skeptical myself. Um, so, and then I mean, you've gone to social networking. Facebook was founded in 2004, and now has a billion users. Twitter, half a billion. Uh, Pinterest, you know, it's only a couple of years old, has tens of millions of users. And then some old stuff, um, email. Now, no one really thinks about digital engagement as involving email, but it was the original um, digital engagement, and now. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now around 85% of the population um, has an email account. Um, and I, I put a little sort of uh, asterisk there. Um, this, the people who did the survey that found that mainly surveyed rich countries, so UK, Canada, America, Germany, Japan. So take these numbers with a grain of salt, um, though <coughs> I would say that um, email has kind of definitely got in there. Um, my father actually has an email account. And I can actually count on the, my one hand the amount of times I've actually seen him use a computer. But he still uses an email for work. So um, it is getting to the point where a lot of digital engagement is almost population-wide. Um, and just the last thing in there, <coughs> there's about 170 million uh, blogs, and that's probably gone up. There's probably about 200 million, however you define a blog um, on the internet. So again, um, these numbers are just sort of give rough ideas. Uh, basically, the ways to engage and how people are engaging digitally is growing exponentially. Um, some of the older stuff, like email, is trailing off, but a lot of the ways you engage, it's just, it's just going straight up. And now you have so many ways to engage with people. Um, and I'm missing so many different things on this. Uh, this is just a couple of ones that just came to my mind. But you have email, you have Messenger, you have Twitter, you have YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, Skype, um, Google Plus. There are just so many ways out there you can engage with your audience and so many choices. And it's only going, there's only going to be more. It just keeps growing. So you can't choose them all. There's, there's just not enough time. Um, some studies out there have found that basically one person can probably handle about two to three platforms of digital engagement. Um, and that takes about 15 hours plus a week. And that's a bit of an average. Um, <coughs> some people are spending 40 or 60 hours. Some people can get away with two or three. Um, but you're looking at these huge time commitments. <laughs> And um, if you're in an organization, or if you're a volunteer, you, how much time can you volunteer? If you're a large organization, how many people can you pay to engage in these different different ways? So um, <coughs> this is already talk, uh, touched on by some of the other speakers, so I'm only going to go over it uh, real quickly. Um, just some sort of outside observations. People look at their audience and their interactions, and that's sort of how they decide how they're going to go about it. Um, I would add a little ca caveat there and say that sometimes um, you'll end up with audiences you didn't expect. So I have a project, uh, Open Access Archaeology. It's a website. It uh, posts stuff about open access publications in archaeology. Well, we started a Tumblr account. Um, and at the beginning there, um, we had a very interesting uh, group of people following. We joined Tumblr mainly just to see what it was about. Um, and we were incredibly popular with youth who happened to be 
um, LBGT, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, and who happen to be like archaeology. Um, we probably dominated that small subsection of the internet uh, for a while there. Um, we've kind of diversified uh, out a bit, um, and I should also say that's people who identify themselves publicly. So the only reason we're able to know that is people follow us, we look at their profiles, and their profiles said, you know, lesbian, gay, bi, transgender, um, and they were open about that. So for a while there, we just cleaned up on the youth. Um, <laughs> segments of that population. So sometimes you're going to connect with uh, different audiences you didn't know you were going to. Um, long term, is that going to help spread the word about open access archaeology? We don't know. Uh, but it was something that, you know, you, sometimes you can just choose a platform and see, see where it goes. Um, also, when you're cho choosing a platform, uh, people have also touched on that. You sort of want to decide how you want to interact. Is it going to be Informative, is it going to be like a blog where you just put stuff up? Is it going to be a conversation? Is it going to be Twitter? All different ways. So these are some of the choices you have. A real problem, and I think uh, Matt highlighted that really well, is stuff doesn't last. And lots of different ways of engaging fail. Um, most, 99% of everything, all startups just never take off. Some that do will start going up and then just collapse. Um, I put Friendster, MySpace. Um, I, I put Facebook not quite at the plateau yet, because who knows. But you eventually get something in towards at the end, like email. Email, everyone has it. It's an open standard. Even if, let's say, Google turned off Gmail, you could go somewhere else and find an email account or set up your own email account. So at the very end, some stuff becomes standards, and that works. But for the most part, a lot of the different ways you're going to engage in the different platforms are going to disappear. And so you kind of have to, and it takes a lot of effort. You're putting in a lot of time. And if you put in a lot of time and then the platform collapses and no one goes, you've just wasted a lot of time. So it's very hard to pull information and what you do off a lot of these platforms. So you can't jump on too early, or you'll possibly run into something where whatever digital engagement you're using collapses. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. And you, some of this you can't control. So Digit, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this website. Um, famous collapsed a couple of years ago. Um, it's, <coughs> excuse me for a second. It was a website where you could post information, links to stuff, and then people would vote up and down. And then the more ups you got, the longer you stayed on the page, more people, it basically drove viewers to whatever you wanted to see. Well, they did a redesign. And that redesign alienated most of their users, and it basically collapsed. No one's on Digit anymore. Um, you can actually go and uh, look at the archaeology Digit, and you'll see that stuff hasn't been posted there in years. Um, <coughs> other stuff that happens is a lot of these places that put up digital um, engagement tools, they have pressures. These, a lot of these are businesses, and they have to make money. Um, I'll get into that. So. One thing you may want to consider when you're thinking about a digital engagement is five minutes. All right. Um, what sort of pressures are these companies under? So uh, these are just some rough numbers, and again, it's very hard to find good financial data on these companies. But uh, when Facebook went public, it was worth a hundred times what it was making in profits. Um, so on the stock market, anything above fifteen is considered overpriced. So you can see all these people have to make money. Um, Facebook has now changed their, uh, their rank algorithm in the last month, and they've also added sponsored stories. So now people are paying to get sto stories out there. So if you have a Facebook page, you're now competing with people who are paying to have their posts seen. Um, so there's a lot of things. Twitter, a couple months ago, also started um, closing out a lot of their stuff to third parties. So now some stuff that used to work with Twitter no longer works. Um, WordPress is fairly stable. Uh, the company is private, and the owners say that, that they're not going to, they're not too, they're profitable, and they're not too interested in selling out, but you never know. Um, lots of other stuff, though. Uh, Tumblr is making no money whatsoever, um, and it's valued close to a billion, and somehow they have to make up that difference. And sometimes making up that difference is going to conflict with your ability to engage. Um, and Facebook, in the last month or so, has just decimated a lot of pages 
a lot of businesses have been very upset because they've changed their algorithm and less people are seeing what's going being posted on their pages. Uh, and that's because also sponsored stories are knocking them down as well. So um, if you're trying to communicate with people via Facebook, they're trying to make money, and that's conflicting. I'm not saying everything will always conflict, but you always have to be aware of how these people are making money, and if that making money is going to stop you from engaging. <coughs> now, what I would actually try to say is you don't really need to pick every single um, way to engage. You don't need to be on Twitter. You don't always need to be on Facebook. I would suggest you actually just do one, and here's the reason why. Um, so about a month ago, a uh, post was put up about dark social, dark media. And so um, that is the sort of media that just doesn't show up in your analytics. Um, I've thrown up my analytics for one of my blogs right here. So this is percentage of people driving traffic to my website. Um, and most anyone, if you saw this, you'd be like, Facebook, I should be on Facebook. That's where the people are. Well, <coughs> if you take away Facebook, you, take, you just take away the top ones. I've taken away all the top ones right there. And I've done dark social. So dark social is when someone clicks on an email attachment. Dark social is someone else's web blog. Dark social is basically everything that doesn't show up nicely in analytics, um, like Facebook, where it doesn't show up as, oh, all this traffic's coming there. Actually, more people who just send out information about my blog in an email or on another blog drives more traffic than Facebook does. And, and also, you have to sort of wonder, um, search is one of the big ones. They're driving people there, but are they driving the right people? These are some search terms um, for my blog, which has nothing to do with my blog. But that's how people get there. So um, <coughs> you really have to be careful. And there's this big push about people saying, oh, a billion people are on Facebook. Facebook is actually incredibly fragmented. Yes, when you look at your analytics, it's going to come up as lots of people are coming there. Um, <coughs> but there's actually 42 million pages. That's 42 million different ways someone could post something on Facebook and it could go to your website. Um, and then, I mean, just people, groups, there's over half a billion different groups. Again, not all these are active. But what's happening is when you look at analytics and you look at all these numbers, you're saying you're seeing Facebook as just one entity. And actually, it's a bunch of different entities happening all over the place. And a lot of time, you can't track it, and you don't actually know what's happening. So um, off the WordPress, they said most of my traffic was, came from 132 shares. I have no idea what people said. All, for all I know, people were like, oh, this person's a horrible, horrible archaeologist. What an idiot. And I got a lot of traffic coming that way. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's the thing is, it's so fragmented. Even if you're on Facebook, you're still missing out on the 400 or you know, 629999999 million other pages where people could be posting stuff and interacting. Uh, there's just so much stuff out there. Um, so I'd sort of like to say is just pick one thing. You can actually get traffic. You don't need to be on Facebook to enjoy uh, what Facebook brings. You can put up links that people can transfer your stuff over to. Um, Choose one thing, do it really well. You don't need to be on multiple platforms, and you don't need to be on the popular platforms. Um, and I would definitely recommend against Walled Garden, because all they do is keep people from sharing stuff out of the garden, but everything comes in. Most of Facebook, if you think about it, most of the content that comes to your newsfeed is not related to Facebook. Yes, update statuses and stuff, but anytime you want to post a link or a video or something, it's coming from another site. So try to be as open as possible when you're thinking about uh, engaging. If you do need to, um, you can, I mean, there's ZooBook, which is uh, for zoo archaeologists. It's a closed, private uh, social network. So maybe that does work. Maybe you want it. But I definitely recommend, if you want a very closed garden system, make one of your own. Uh, Ning Sites do, does it pretty well. And <coughs> you can set it, and you have control. And you don't have to worry about Facebook deciding that they need to make money off of you and cut off your ability to communicate. <coughs>